Hello, my name's Charlie Lees. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and professor of gastroenterology at the University of Edinburgh. It's a great privilege to be here to speak to you virtually today. I'm going to be talking about treatment principles and mucosal healing in Crohn's disease specifically uh, for this talk. So here are my disclosures. Crohn's disease can have a really very significant impact on almost all facets of an individual's life, from the obvious physical aspects that we're very familiar with, gut symptoms, extra-intestinal manifestations, systemic upset, but also psychological aspects. Um, there are long-term complications of the disease and potentially of therapies, um, and also on everyday life. So we should be very mindful of this. And this is all particularly important given that we know that treatment failure and disease progression, in particular for Crohn's disease, are a very big problem indeed. And really one of the crux of the issues here is that we don't have good predictive models. Same for ulcerative colitis, of course, but in Crohn's disease, I think actually the consequences are greater. I'm going to come back to this issue in a minute. So let's just stop and have a think. We have a number of therapeutic agents now that are effective in Crohn's disease and actually highly effective in Crohn's disease. Anti-TNF um, drugs, of course, um, astakinumab, vedlizumab, and most recently P19 inhibitors in the form of rizankizumab, gazelkumab, and uh, mirakizumab. Crohn's disease is classically a progressive disease. Most people present with purely inflammatory disease. Over time, it progresses to stricturing and penetrating complications. This gives us this inflammatory window of opportunity early on in diagnosis, and we should remember that given that our drugs are anti-inflammation medicines. And so we now know from the trials of anti-TNF therapy um, as well, in fact, of all biologics in Crohn's disease, that shorter disease duration results in better outcomes. This is clinical remission stacked up when you look at the trials overall. Now, this has just been updated, and I think this is a fantastic new paper from Shomron, Ben Horin, um, and others just gone online in gastroenterology when they've done an individual patient data level meta-analysis of all the different um, in TNF trials in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it confirms what we thought has been the case for a while now. Early effective therapy in uh, Crohn's disease is key, whereas in ulcerative colitis, the duration between diagnosis and the commencement of therapy seems to be less um, important. And in fact, in this analysis, it is completely flat. So sticking to Crohn's disease, this is data that we've generated in Edinburgh and published in JCC just over a year ago now, where we looked at era of diagnosis. This is a population level inception cohort. So on the right hand side, you can see we've divided this up into four cohorts, 2000 to 2004, 2005 to 8, 2009 to 13, 2014 to 17. So that was year of diagnosis. And on the right, you can see time to first biologic. Um, and so it was very slow, in fact, initially. This is when I started working in Edinburgh in IBD in 2003, where patients were effectively had to earn their right onto a biologic. Whereas now, 2014 to 17, you can see it's much quicker, much earlier, and actually the shape of the curve has changed. This represents a lot of top-down therapy. And on the left, what you can then see is that the number of surgeries and the time to first surgery has decreased um, in association. This isn't causality, but in association with um, earlier therapy with biologics. We've been able to do this in part now because of a uh, proactive and widespread adoption of biosimilar anti-TNF therapy first with infliximab in 2015 and then with adalimumab in 2018. Um, and of course, there are now multiple different molecules for infliximab and adalimumab available globally um, using different brand names. And this has been really transformative for us in, um, in the UK. 
uh, I'll add a limumab usage just to show you one data point has increased quite significantly over time, in part in 2016 and 17, in anticipation of the biosimilar switch you could, that you can then see on this bar chart in 2019 and 2020, noting that the data point here for 2020 was an incomplete year, so the usage is still higher again. So we've been doing this to try and treat earlier with doses that are most effective um, and also freeing up in the drug budget money for the patients that need non-anti-TNF based strategies. But with this, it's meant that we've used very little thiopurine monotherapy for Crohn's disease uh, in recent years. So here we are, patients early on treating below just the symptoms, treating the inflammation, and changing the natural history of the disease course. Early effective therapy will change the natural history of Crohn's disease course. But there is a problem here, and the problem is twofold. Firstly, we lack good predictive power, and we lack good predictive power at almost all stages of Crohn's disease. Who will get it? What will happen to them? What drug will they respond to? Will they flare? Will their disease progress? And then the second problem relates to that because some people at diagnosis will look very similar to each other, but some will just have a relatively quiescent disease course. And when we look on a population level, we know that that is approximately a third of all patients. So if we just treat everyone aggressively, we will overtreat, but we will also run the risk of undertreating if we're too cautious and we need to get in early to prevent the disease from progressing. So this is the, the crux of the issue. Can we stratify at diagnosis by risk for aggressive versus quiescent disease? And could we then ideally treat by biology so that we could look at the risk factors for uh, drug A versus uh, drug B? Now, because we haven't been very good at points one or two here, we've got very good at point three, which is monitoring with a treat target paradigm where we adjust therapy to reach the target that we have set. And one of the things that we've done in Edinburgh is we've really um, adopted early chiropractin from 2005 um, in clinical practice. And we've now looked very carefully to see how we can best use this to help get around some of the key issues in Crohn's disease in particular. So one of the things that Nick Pleveris did a couple of years ago was ask the question, if you normalize calprotectin in year one of diagnosis in Crohn's disease, how did that then predicate your disease course over time? In other words, could we use this as some kind of proxy measurement in the first year to distinguish those people who need further therapy and those that do not? Not a workaround for everything, but perhaps a good guide. And, and it's very striking actually what you see here. So in the blue, you see those people who normalize calprotectin in year one to less than 250. And in the red, you see those that don't. And those in the red more rapidly accumulate disease progression by Montreal behavior, hospitalization for disease flare, and surgery with resections. Um, and you can see this all the way out, separating further and further as you go out to years 10 uh, of diagnosis and beyond. 250 seems to be about right. We put in an extra threshold of less than 50, and that looked very similar to 250 to 250. So you may not target everyone with a biologic at diagnosis, but if you're not normalizing calprotectin in year one, get on and treat. When we looked at what the predictors of normalization of calprotectin in year one were, we saw that actually early um, a combination therapy or monotherapy with the biologic was strongly associated with normalization. And this was early in the first three months, in fact. So getting on early where you've got risk factors is very important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that puts this all into um, the framework of treat to target for IBD overall, for Crohn's disease we're talking about here. Um, and this is the updated guidance from STRIDE 2, where you have a patient with active Crohn's disease, you look for a symptomatic response, symptomatic remission and normalization of CRP and then calprotectin, normalization of growth in children, and then endoscopic healing 
normalized quality of life and the absence of disability. So really important to bear this all in mind. Transmural healing looks to be very important in Crohn's disease. It wasn't deemed um, significant enough based on the current data to go in as a formal treatment target in stride two, but do just bear that in mind that that I think will come over time. So if we want to get our patients um, well in Crohn's disease, we need to get things right early and we can then look to set our patients up for success. So stratifying by risk to overcome the massive disease heterogeneity, treating by biology, and if we can't, just making sure that we treat with early effective therapy. And I think that now means a non-thiopurine-based approach early on, and then keeping patients in deep remission over time with monitoring. And of course, there's lots to be gained by the success here for patients, for the for the service, for, for the um, health service overall with, with cost, but most importantly in terms of reducing symptoms, reducing disability, reducing surgeries and the disease progression and the complications of therapy over time. So let's just have a look at this in a little bit more detail, specifically with Crohn's disease and thinking particularly about risk. The Bogery criteria we've known for about 15, 20 years now, young age, smoking, extensive small bowel disease, perianal disease, steroid diagnosis, weight loss, also deep ulcers at endoscopy. But it's not really advanced very much. And this is a bit of an issue because really we would like to be able to um, have got much further now already with some more precision medicine approaches to um, risk of Crohn's disease progression. Genetics hasn't really helped us here. We did a very large genotype phenotype study in the International IBD Genetics Consortium in 17,000 patients, which I led a few years ago now. We found this strong association with NOD2 with small bowel disease. We found the strong association with an MHC locus with colonic disease. This then um, really very neatly starts to help us parcel out by location. But when we look by disease behavior, actually we saw a very flat genotype phenotype association across the piece. So on a purely um, germline genomic um, association level, we don't see factors that help us with disease progression or disease behavior in Crohn's disease. Other factors may come to help us. Um, James Lee and Miles Parks in Cambridge have been working on this CD8 transcriptomic signature, now in whole blood. Um, to divide patients with aggressive versus quiescent Crohn's disease. And the profile study, um, the world's first truly biomarker stratified study in Crohn's disease, completes recruitment in a couple of months. So we'll look forward to those data next year to see how useful this is in clinical practice. So let's think now about therapy for Crohn's disease, and we can then start to move on to mucosal healing um, after that. Choosing the right drug for the right patient at the right time really is the critical issue. And now we have multiple effective drugs, we have some very interesting questions. What's the role of precision medicine uh, versus head-to-head -head studies, drug sequencing, role of biosimilars, antibody small molecules, and combinations of therapies? Um, these are all interesting things. Now, anti-TNF therapy is still very effective for Crohn's disease. Uh, but we have the problems of primary non-response and secondary loss of response due to immunogenicity. And then, of course, the problem that after anti-TNF failure, other drugs work less well. So we then have our sequencing problem. Immunogenicity to biologic therapy seems to be an infliximab mostly, but also adalimab problem, much less so. Um, and almost inconsequential, I think, with vedlizumab, ustekinumab, and the other newer biologics coming. Immunogenicity leads to less drug. It leads to less effic efficacy, um, more infusion reactions for infliximab, and, of course, increased discontinuation. Tarek Ahmed's brilliant PANT study um, has identified this HLA haplotype, DQA1, star 05, on chromosome six that strongly associates with the development of anti-drug antibodies. 
um, with infliximab and adalimumab shown here for infliximab when you layer in combination therapy and carriage of, of one risk allele here or not. Um, and so really here patients that um, are on monotherapy but have the risk allele almost all develop antibodies to infliximab within a year. In fact, uh, many people have started to use this in their clinical practice now. We haven't yet in Edinburgh, but I'm really excited to hear next year what Seb sachi has been doing in Hull because they've already been adopting this in their clinical practice with a paradigm similar to this here, where if you have um, a, an HLA haplotype positive patient in the red who is contraindicated to combination therapy um, for whatever reason, then you avoid anti-TNF first line and then go in with either ustekinumab or vedolizumab with a view that you might then use the anti-TNF later um, if the um, other biologic hasn't worked. So here we are, we have multiple different therapeutic targets and we're gonna just spend a few minutes trying to make sense of what drug to use where and when. Um, precision medicine approaches have largely failed us to date. So we're gonna concentrate on what we know from the clinical trials data. Um, and we're gonna look at this through the lens of head-to-head -head studies actually, because we have a number of head-to-head -head studies in Crohn's disease that are very instructive already. Of course, starting back in 2010 with Sonic, that so very clearly showed us that infliximab plus azathioprine was superior to infliximab alone, which in turn was superior to azathioprine alone in bio-naive Crohn's patients. We had the step up top down study, a strategy study um, that showed certainly early on, and when you then looked much later on, that early combined immunosuppression was superior to conventional management group. And then you have CALM, of course, which was um, the, uh, the first true sort of treat to target design um, which of course is very familiar to us now, so I'll just cut to the chase. We we know that in the tight control arm um, with early Crohn's disease here, that um, with this endoscopic endpoint here at a year, that the tight control group did very much better based on mostly changing things on the calprotectin, also CRP and symptoms by a guide rather than just clinical management was very much more effective. So that was adalimumab early in Crohn's disease. We now this year have a true head-to-head -head biologic versus biologic study in Crohn's disease, C-view, that has tested Stellara astekinumab versus Humira adalimumab um, with placebo double dummy um, in both. Without dose escalation, what was very striking here in the early Crohn's disease, two years median after diagnosis, that both drugs performed very well um, in the first year. The readout here was only a year. I wish this trial had had a two-year primary endpoint, um, and I wish we would see further long-term outcomes, but I don't believe we will. Nonetheless, looking at the primary endpoint, um, proportion of patients in clinical remission at the end of a year, um, really excellent rates with both of these drugs. Um, slightly lower um, levels of um, adverse reaction in ustekinumab versus adalimumab, as you would expect. Okay, so just to reorientate ourselves back to our treat-to-target paradigm in Crohn's disease, just to layer in for the last part here, a whistle-stop tour of mucosal healing in Crohn's disease, widely defined as the absence of ulceration across the different Crohn's disease trials. However, we know that um, the endpoints of mucosal healing have differed over time, as has the trial design over time. So it's quite difficult to make hard comparisons between trial A versus trial B, and therefore between drug A versus drug B, because the definition of mucosal healing differs, the study design type differs, and the study population differs, with now many more biofailure patients in the studies that we have. And the reporting of mucosal healing endpoints has evolved over this time period from the early clinical trials via 
this 2016 IOIBD consensus to the later clinical trials here where we have mucosal healing, endoscopic remission, and endoscopic response all labeled. I think most commonly adopted in clinical practice now is the SESCD. This is what we use when we do score. We don't score it in everyone. It's not that widespread still, even for us, but when we do score, we aim to try and get an SESCD for as many of our Crohn's disease patients as we can. So let's just have a look. So let's look first at anti-TNF therapy in uh, Crohn's disease, and let's look at the mucosal healing endpoint. And I've looked at this here for infliximab from Accent 1, the endoscopic substudy on the left. Then you've got uh, two studies for adalimumab. You've got Extend, and then more recently, Serene CD. So if you look at Serene CD and Accent 1, you'll see mucosal healing rates of about um, 40 to 60%. Um, at a year. You can then look at immunity and stardust for ustekinumab. Um, um, and of course, for ustekinumab now also, you can look at Seaview, which has some very nice endoscopic healing data showing that ustekinumab is very comparable to um, adalimumab um, as anti-TNF therapy in early Crohn's disease. And we have the data from Versify as well as from CD Love on vedalizumab, um, showing also um, mucosal healing um, at a year. And then most recently, just picking one of the more recent studies, this is the early um, mucosal healing data from a subset of the risankizumab phase three studies, advance and motivate, showing endoscopic response um, in the two different studies on the left um, and on the right. Um, you can look at the, the first group here, which is the 600 milligram uh, dosing of risankizumab. Uh, so that's it, really, just to bring us back to a summary point. So Crohn's disease is progressive. We don't have good predictive power. Um, we do know that early effective therapy is absolutely key. We mustn't over-treat everyone, um, or at least mustn't over-treat um, the minority, but we also mustn't under-treat the majority. So where there are risk factors go in with early effective therapy, that means a biologic. For most of us now, that means adalimab, infliximab, or vedlizumab, and Um, If you are in any doubt in year one, monitor, and we do that by the calprotectin every two months. If it's not dropping below 250, then start biologic therapy then. Use a treat-to-target paradigm, monitor, 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 adjust on the basis of the monitoring, including TDM. And this way, we will change the natural history of Crohn's disease over time. With thanks to you for listening, with thanks to my team for producing some of these data that I have listed here, um, and I look forward to some questions. Thank you very much indeed. That is it for now. Goodbye.